Hello and welcome to Books and Beyond. I'm your host, Jimmy Bennett. Uh, Books and Beyond is the show where we help people personify their aspirations. Uh, before I get to my guest, I'd just like to say uh, happy summer to everybody. I hope you're having a good summer. It's been, uh, well, it's getting hot and crazy, but uh, if you haven't gotten flooded out or dehydrated yet, you're doing good. Um, I have uh, just want to mention real quickly uh, about the Southeastern Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association, CAPA, that uh, I am a member of and my guest today is a member of. Um, we meet every third Monday of the month, usually at the Groton Public Library, but you'll have to stay tuned because the Groton Public Library is actually having some renovations right now, so they're not uh, quite open. Um, but as we go along, uh, it's a great place for people that want to write or are writers to network with fellow writers, learn certain things. We have great speakers um, and just a good group of people. Very inspiring. I, I, I started right be even before I wrote my first book and now I have four. And I found it very, very inspiring and very helpful. And I'd like to see uh, people come out and check us out. I um, also want to give a shout out to the Mystic No Ink Library. I went to a couple of their writers workshops, which were fascinating. Um, one was on the difference between writing true crime stories and fictitious crime stories. And another one was on writing short stories. Both uh, very informative, great speakers, great people. And in fact, they'll probably be on my show eventually too. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we got a lot of good shows coming up, hopefully. And very soon, I think, me and Chef Brian Yemma will be back for a summer cooking show, which uh, we've always enjoyed. It's always been a lot of fun. But that's enough about me and the show, because the show today is Karen Warfield. And well, Karen thank is you. A, thank you. Welcome, Karen. Glad thank you. you made it. Uh, Karen's a fellow member of Kappa. That's where we actually met. And uh, we just did an event at the Norwich... Rose, Rose Arts Festival, right? Um, which was wonderful, which is a great turnout. It was a fun time. Uh, all the authors were there from Kappa, well, most of them, some of them. Um, it was a good time, and uh, if you missed it, well, next year we'll be back, so show up. So, so how are you doing, Karen? I'm doing great. Thank you're, you for having me. Yep. You know, yeah. You're back home from your uh, camping experiences? Uh, well, um, we're back home for four days, and then we go back out. Right. We're, camp hosts at a uh, Army Corps of Engineers camping ground. So, um, yeah, this is my first day back. And uh, How's that? Is that that must be fun, huh? Just uh, It's a lot of work, but it's it? fun. I, we get a seasonal site for the summer, and we work. It's a 12-hour day. It's a long day, but you, wow. you get to meet a lot of people. Yep. And uh, interesting, we had people from Texas, California, Amsterdam. Oh, wow. Yeah, so all wow. over the world. Are these all service members? No. Okay. No, okay. It, it's just Army Corps of Engineers runs the campground, West Thompson Lake, by the way, um, and it's open to anybody, tent sites, RV sites. Okay. Real nice. Real Great. Nice, so. so I'd like to talk a little bit about you because I was fascinated reading your uh, biography. Well, um, you, you went to Southern Illinois University? Well, I right after high school, I joined the Army because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, and that was for three years. I got out, and I worked at the sub-base for the Department of Defense, and while I was there, I went to a extension program for SIU. Oh, okay. Yeah, and got oh. my bachelor's. and. I was born in Illinois, that's why. Oh, I was, okay, I that's there. right. Yeah. I, yeah. Every male family... A member of my family has been born in uh, Suffolk County, Long Island for 500 years, except for me. Except for you. And my father was a instructor at the submarine base. Oh, really? At the sub school. Oh, and nice. And that's where I was born. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, up in the frozen waste. So, and you served, you served for, in the Army. I was uh, three years in. I, I was supply, logistics. Okay. You know, I got to admit, I loved every minute of it. Did you? I really did. And, um... It just happened that I did my three years and I got out and it, it served me well because it helped me to get my DOD job. Right. You know, I had that background. Right. So they snapped me up. 
and I spent 17 years on the sub base. Nice. And then uh, I got married, and you know things went a different direction. Right, as they do. Yep. And okay. So we got involved in the Norwich Historical Society. Norwich did not have a, a society at the time, and Bill Stanley, I don't know if anybody remembers Bill, he has passed, but he was a great historian, um, loved Norwich, and he decided with Peggy Wilson to start the Historical Society, and he kind of tapped me and my husband David on the shoulder to help, you know, start it up, and we had no clue what we were right. doing. We really didn't. I think we lasted two years, <laughs> yeah. you know, because it, it is a lot of work. Right. It is a lot of work. And my hat's off to the now present society because they are doing fantastic things. So the Norris Historical Society, do they have a site, a building? Um, they do have a visitor center okay. um, on the green, and they do have a website. Okay. And um, they run events throughout the year. I think the last one they hooked up with the Leffingwell Museum. Okay. So you have to watch the calendar of the events. No, I, I think that's fascinating. I was uh, surprised because actually the set of stories that I'm working on now are set in Mystic between okay. the years of 1919 and 1932. Okay. And so I've been doing research and stuff. And I went up to the Mystic River Historical Society and I was just amazed. Mm -hmm. At the, All societies at the are a great resource right. if you like, I like historical fiction, so for me, if I see an event, I'm usually there with my notebook because something interesting, maybe I can weave into right. the story. Right. So that's how I pick up my information, and a lot of times just on the internet, I'll do some research and I'll go down that bunny trail. and you know what, I didn't know that happened. I wonder right. how many people realize that that's what actually happened. That's the thing about writing historical fiction I've found. The more research you do for your story leads you to like a hundred ideas for other stories. And it's very hard to pull yourself away and focus. Right. Okay, I was looking yeah. at this, but right. somehow I ended up over here. Right, so. right. Or you put it in afterwards and you say, why did I... Yeah, that doesn't, it, it doesn't really, that doesn't, it doesn't really, fit. yeah, it doesn't fit, so. you know. Um, and now, also, you were involved with uh, something nine square mile. Now, nine mile, mile square. square. Nine yeah, mile square. that was a Bill Stanley book, and oh, I don't okay. remember. I don't know if you remember Bill Stanley. He used to write for the Bulletin. The I remember the Bulletin. name. I, okay. I, I, wanna, okay. I don't want to, you know, yeah. act like I, you know, we're yeah. buddies. And but. he did the Once Upon a Time stories. Oh, okay, all you know, right. Yep. And he finally put them all into one book, and it was the uh, Nine Mile Square book. Okay. And I helped edit that book. Oh, all right. So that's my connection to that. And this right was there. all stories about Norwich? And all stories about Norwich. Bill Stanley was a great photographer, and I'm not, I'm probably not doing him justice, but he used all those pictures he took over the many years to put the book together. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of fascinating... History. Norwich has got a lot of fascinating history. Norwich is a fascinating place, especially when you realize that, you know, 1890, around that time frame, there were more millionaires per capita than any other city on the East Coast. Oh, I didn't know that. Norwich was a hustling, bustling town. I know, the, I know that people don't realize the, the extent of... Uh, the entertainment and stuff that used to be. I know the Frank Sinatras used yes. to perform in Norwich, yep. and there was a lot of big, big names. Big back names, then. big names yeah. at one of the theaters, and it was a, it was quite the town. And I, I don't know what happened to all the hustle and bustle, but things, you know, change over time. And Norwich was also known for its billiards, a lot of billiard championships, and boxing, of all things. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Either. Yeah, you, know, you got to really talk to the older generation, right. if I can say that. My father was a great historian. He loved Norwich. He grew up in Norwich, Norwich, you know, all the way. And I got a lot of my ideas from him because he would tell me the real story behind what you're right. reading in the paper. No, right. it really happened like this. And I, oh, really? You know, I was talking to one person at a 
dinner um, gathering, and he had bought the um, hay, Haymarket building down in Norwich, and this was in the 80s, I believe. And he looked at the building, looked at the outside, inspected the inside, and something did not match up. You know, there were more floors on the inside than the outside. And he said, how come I'm, there's four floors, I'm going up and down the stairs, but only three rows of windows? Well, there was a half floor. So he discovered that, and he went in there, and it was a little bordello. Oh, wow. Yeah, back in the time. Yeah. You know, the sailors come into the harbor. Right. What do you have when you have sailors? Right. You had the bars, the drinking, and what else? Yep, prostitution, right. Exactly. So that did make it into the book, of course. Oh, okay. Of course. I yeah. said, that is too good to let go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So little stories like that I try to incorporate. So. Which is, you know, I'm, I'm, you've made a point about talking to your father and your father telling you. And this is something that I've tooted on the show since I started doing it, mm -hmm. was that people not only should everybody write down their own experiences or tape record them or something because when you think about how much the area has changed even since i was a kid right 50 years ago when i you know i i moved into no Ankh when i was 14 and you know i was a navy brat and so um but how much has changed and you know i think that these kids you know or my children and stuff don't realize. Just, yeah, just don't realize they it have, would be fascinated to. They have uh, no clue. Um, I was talking to a couple of people the other day, and uh, I said, you see all the trees? They said, yeah. They said, there was no trees here. Yeah. It was all farmland and pastures. Right. There was no trees. And you look now, and there's trees everywhere. And you try to imagine no trees back when, no stone walls. Right. You know, it was open land. Right. I mean, you talk to a, a teenager about... Um, an ice house. Well, what's an ice right. house? Right, right. You had to go get your ice. Yeah. You know, it was a, a woman's day was long because there were no conveniences. Yeah. There were no one stop shopping. You had to go to the bakery. You had to go to the laundry. You had to, you know, all yeah. this stuff. And I don't think the kids realized that it was a long, hard day for mm -hmm. both. Right. Sets of parents, the, the father oh, yeah. and the mother. And I try to get a little bit into that also. And they were long, hard work days. Yep. And 15 hour days, that was nothing. That was normal. Right. For, for little, little money. Right. You know, and the kids worked right beside the parents. Yep. You know, and there were no unions. And there were no, it, OSHA was. Far from right. being even a thought, you know, in the textile business, there were open lie pits. Yep. You know, and you think about all this, and it's amazing that that generation even survives. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. So, right. Yeah, but I try to piece all that together to make a story that's interesting. And my hope is that somebody will say, I want to learn more about that. Right. I want to learn more about that. Well, as like you said, that's why I always encourage people to talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents, you know, write your stories down, mm -hmm. write what they tell you down, and keep it because it's, it, this history is what, you know, gets lost. Like you say, you can read the books, you know, Norris right. is this, Norris and that, but it's the stories behind it. Right. And the, and the little fascinating tales. And, and, and the you know, points of view that, oh, yeah. I didn't think of it that way. Which is another thing, too, is I think... Uh, Especially nowadays in the social media and woke generation with the instant communication and stuff all the time. And I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I think in a lot of ways they, even the younger people have a harder time understanding older people. Mm -hmm. Because we grew up differently in a different era, in a different time, right. and different attitudes. Right. You know? Right. And, you know, I'm not saying that you can't learn and you can't, you know, be more tolerant or whatever, but... It's just the way we were raised, yeah. you know what and, I mean? You know, you say that, and a, a scenario comes to mind. I remember I was working for um, Bill on the book, and I was 
in his office, and he had his secretary. Then there was me that was working on the book, and I overheard him say, I'll have my girl call your girl. Well, nowadays, if you said yeah. that, holy, you know? Yeah. And, but I didn't think anything of it because that's the generation right. he grew up with. So right. that's how he talks, yep. you know? And I, I think sometimes people will talk because that's how I grew up. And somebody might get offended, but I'm sorry, that's how I grew up. Right. That's the language I learned. I always say, I always tell people, I, I tell the young guys at work, I said, look, I'm aware. Maybe I'm not awake, but yeah. I'm aware. Okay, I'm, you know, but you have to understand yeah. it's different, you know what I mean? It's different than what I learned and what I grew up right. with and stuff. And that leads into when you get to a historical fiction, sometimes you get into subjects, slavery, abortion, um, you know, the terms that they may right. have used back then but now are considered offensive I struggle with that right you know I do do I use this word right. or don't I use this word yeah you know and well if you're talking about my next book is taking place in the 1640s right in the uh, Gales Ferry area um, if I'm writing there in that time frame I have to use the word right. the colonial List used, right. and they are offensive right. nowadays. They are right. offensive. So you struggle with that. Right. You struggle with that. You know, and I look at the notices that all the book bannings that are going on. Yeah. You know, and the libraries, and it, it's like, and I hate to say this, it is what it is, but that book was written at a certain period right. of time, and that book is actually. A reflection of that period of time. Right. So why are we banning these books? Yeah, it, it, you know, well, let's face it. Almost anything can be offensive to somebody, even if it's not offensive to our culture in America. It could right. be offensive to the culture in Yemen or, right. or you know, or, or other countries and stuff. It, it's just, you know, and you, as long as you can, all right, that's fine. But it's a matter of tolerance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well. I think if we were, if society was totally clean on their language, we'd be a very boring society. Yeah. We really would yeah. be. I yep. mean, there would be nothing left to talk about because you can't talk about anything. Right, right. So, so but anyways, let's get to your book because that's what. Okay, uh, okay. That's what we're here for. Um, it is the white glove. The white, yes, white gloves, and. It, I called it White Gloves. I named it White Gloves. It's my little baby here. Because um, back in 2000, my husband and I bought a 1790 house with an 1890 edition. So as a result, it needed a lot of upgrades. So one day, we're sitting on the porch, and uh, he looked bored. And I said, why don't you go find that fireplace that you think is behind the wall in the upstairs bedroom? Now, we had gone up there, and we're inspecting the place, and you could feel the mantle. Somebody had right. covered up the fireplace. So he took a sledgehammer, and by golly, he found a chimney there. And I call it a step chimney. It kind of went up with the old bricks, 1790 oh, nice. bricks. You know. But on the side of the chimney was a pair of white gloves. Oh, wow. Yeah. And a bracelet, a child's bracelet made out of sea pods. You know, um, yeah. they just sewed them together right. and made a bracelet. And so I said, you know, there's got to be a story here. Why would somebody not take those out of there? Right. You know, that type of thing. So I started writing the book in 2000. I wrote the first 17 pages. I, I'm good to go, right? Yeah. Then life got in the way. And... 2018, I picked it back up. I read the first 17 pages, and I hated every word of it. You know, it sounded like Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. I, I like Little House on the Prairie, right. but I don't want to write like right. that. You know, so I redid that. I came up with some ideas. I came up with a family saga line. You know, um, you follow the family through all these trials and tribulations, and... Out came white gloves. 
Now, the very interesting thing about this, and hardly anybody asked me, but it is so obvious, what's missing on the cover of that book? Well, I don't know if that's the way they look at it, but... Uh, it's called White Gloves. What's oh, missing? there's no, no there's White, no white Gloves. There's no White Gloves. Nobody ever asked me that question. Yeah. You know? But um, I picked that... Did you purposely leave them out? Well, I picked that picture from uh, Getty's Images there, and I liked her hands because in the story, Edwina is a servant girl that gets into upper society, but she has strong hands because she was a servant girl. So I wanted uh, to show her hands, but there is a reason why the white gloves are not yeah. displayed on the cover of the book, and I hate to say it, but you got to read right, the book right, yeah, to find that's out, fine. No, you know, that's good. which is a very um, moral reason in Edwina's eyes, you know, why she does not wear white yep. gloves. All right. So. And now, is your story set in Norwich? It is. It's set in Norwich, um, 1860. Uh, I involve some of Norwich's features and architecture and some of the names you might recognize some of the streets you might recognize. I wanted to incorporate Norwich Hospital. Right. You know, because there's a story right there in itself. But Norwich Hospital wasn't built till 1909. So I had to use Middletown okay. Hospital. And at that time, they weren't called hospitals. They were called asylums. That's right. That's yeah. right, yeah. So it's, there's some very interesting facts related about that. There's, I also read on the internet and I wanted to incorporate a woman by the name of Mrs. Packard. Now Mrs. Packard was married to a minister and he was very successful, um, but one day she had the audacity to ask him a question during Bible class, a question that he struggled to answer. His response to her was to admit her to an insane asylum. Back then you could do that. And a lot of husbands did that to their wives. Wow. Especially when they wanted a new model, yeah. so to speak. So Mrs. Packard, being this a smart woman, upper society, went forward to Congress and documented her stay in this insane asylum. And she, through her writings, she got a lot of things changed during that time period. Oh. So go on the internet and look up uh, Mrs. Packard congressional legislation, and I'm sure she'll pop up. But I want to say her book is about 400 pages long, and it's fascinating because she was there for a number of years before she could finally get out of there. Wow. So, and then she wrote the book and went before Congress right. and got some things changed. So I incorporated some of her stories in there too. Of course, the characters have been, you know, renamed and right. all of that. But um, it's a it's a good summer read. It's a I want to say a short read, but the facts and if you continue the research are fascinating. Yep. You know. See, I I did that. Uh I did that with my books, you know, I used Gillette's Castle and right. William Gillette, you know, so I try to use as many real places, real times, and as I said, I was working on a set, I'm working on a set of short stories set in Mystic now, and I'm trying to incorporate a lot of the history into it, because right. like you say, um, there's the times when, uh, you know, I went to Carl C. Cutler High School, uh, junior high. Okay. Well, I had no idea who Carl Cutler was. It was yeah. just Cutler, Cutler yeah. Jr. High. And then I'm doing the research, and it turns out he's one of the guys who started the Mystic Seaport. You know, so yeah. that to me was kind of fascinating. And now that school's gone too, but, you know, whatever. And look but, at Mystic know, Seaport, how it yeah, blew up. How, how that blew up and yeah. how big that is now. And, and I, stuff, I'm so. sure, was he a sea captain? or? No, or no, just, I think he was a... Um, uh, a businessman, I think. Okay. You know, yeah. Okay. I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of hidden stories behind yeah. him too. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um, but anyways, yeah. So that's always good to you know do your research and look up and and like I said, it does give you inspiration to you know if you live in Norwich, you know you might walk down the street every day, but then you can, yeah. now you can look at it yeah. and go, wow, there used to be a big huge mansion here, you know. And, 
right. that kind of thing. It's, right. it's, I always found that really to be really great. Yep. Um, and there are pictures in the book, so they might... Oh, there is? Yes. Okay. So they might recognize some of the mansions. They, they are still there. Yep. They are still there. Good. So... Good. Got so what are you working on now? Um, right now I'm working on a book, 1640s, right after the uh, uh, Pequot War. Oh, okay. Down in Mystic. Yeah. So, and the colonists are coming over and they're, they're settling in and their relationship to the Indians, their relationship to other colonists, their relationship to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, how that all, all works yep. out. You know, and the stories behind that. You see, you like me, you get that that uh, historical fiction. Yeah. Um, I kind of love it. I, uh, I mean, I, I I write the mysteries, murder mysteries, crime stories, stuff like that, and uh, maybe some somewhat of a cop out, but nowadays with modern forensic scientists and the internet and mm -hmm. cameras and security footage and stuff like that, it's really pretty hard to get away with much. You know, uh, but back then you could get away with stuff unless somebody was smart enough to figure it out. Right. So that's what I try to, you know. But in these stories that I'm doing, I'm really trying to make it half historical, mm -hmm. you know, with a little mystery woven in just to keep you interested. Well, you know? the nice thing about those books is Gillette's Castle, it might inspired them, I want to see this place. Well, that's what you know, I, you know, I want to see this place. And it's funny because, you know, how many people come up to me and go, oh my God, I haven't been there since I was a kid. Yeah. I was a, and it's a beautiful state park, you know. And Norwich is a beautiful town. You know, I haven't been to Norwich in years and years. Um, honestly, since uh, we've talked about it since back when I was young. Right. Um, you know, rolling up drunk and going to the shows of the Norwich the Art Festival, you know, yes, yes. that kind of thing. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful city. It's, it it's, is. The architecture is great. Yeah. You know, and hopefully we don't lose sight of that. You're right. Right. Don't lose sight of that. Keep it going. So. So, um, well, I'm looking forward to that. That's that's. Uh, how long? How far along are you? You just sort of cruising. I, I've done two serious edits. Yep. Um, and I'm working on a third edit. I say serious, that's when you actually pay somebody to right. do an edit, you know. And then, of course, you have then friends and family that will Proof edit. Read it, yeah. yeah. So I'm hoping, I really want to do traditional publishing with this one. Okay, good. But if not, I'll go self-publish. Right. But I, I, think it's, I think it's a good story to tell and make the kids, I say kids and adults, think about the historical value that they may have lost sight of right you know to know these facts and many and, let's face it many of our kids like you know my grandparents on my mother's side both came from england and uh ireland mm -hmm. scotland and ireland um my ancestors from way back came from england but most people if you really find you know if you really think about it their great parents great great grandparents they they came over from the, from Europe, other countries, and that was something like that. That was not an easy. Voyage. No, and it, it's not like you know, you know getting a passport and flying in. It was and, not know. easy, guys. Yeah, so, so I think it's it's stuff that they need to learn to appreciate where they are now right. in life. You know. Right. Well, anyways, okay. this has been fantastic, Karen. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank um, you. Looking forward to seeing you, Cap, and looking forward to your next book. Okay. Um, you take care, and we'll see you next time. So that's it for Books and Beyond this time. I'm Jimmy Bennett, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.